And also, then you can learn different areas of algebraic topology and explain them to me. <laughs> All right, the recording has started. <coughs> and so we will start the second part. All right, so we're going to take two maps again, uh, but they're not going to be from between the same things. So one is from x to z, and the other one is from y to z. All right, and we're not going to impose any other properties on them. Um, their pullback, again, should one exist, <coughs> is a pair, or, sorry, a triple. Uh, I'm going to write p, little px from p to x, and little y from p to y. Um, such that, all right, I want a diagram to commute. I'm going to start with uh, my map from x to z. I'm going to have another map from y to z. This is f. This is g. Um, and so my pullback is is a map is p and a map into x, so px, and a map into y, py, such that this square commutes. OK? So that's just saying that going this way is equal to going that way. <coughs> All right. Um, and it satisfies the universal property such that if I have some other object q, together with maps, say qx and qy, such that this new outer square commutes, there is a unique morphism from q to p, such that these triangles commute. All right. <coughs> now, Julie, if we have maps, uh, we'll let f be from a to b and g be from a to c. <coughs> their push out is all right it's again a triple which i guess i'll just call p again uh and so now i want something all right so here i had i had maps going out of the out of the object. Now I'm going to have maps going into the object. So I want maps from B into P. <coughs> Say iota C from C into P. All right, such that, all right, what's our setup this time? This time we have A, we have F, A and B and F, and then we have G. From A to C. All right. And <coughs> our um, push out is going to satisfy that this square commutes. Great. <coughs> and, mm, and. And given any other such triple, so we have q, <coughs> we have. Is there a reason that you put the diagram instead of just the roots and the arrows? 
uh, yeah, arrows should go down and to the right. I could just reverse the arrows in this diagram. And some people do, and those people are monsters. So this is A to B. And this is A to C. No, uh, out of the page. Down right out of the page. Although I think that it's, it's a little less awful if you go the other way with that third dimension. All right. Uh, and so then you want a unique map here such that these triangles commute. OK, so to push out is these three pieces of information and the fact that this square commutes. Um, all right. So let's see an example or examples <coughs> in set the pullback. That's not a P. The pullback. of some f from x to z and g from y to z is the set. All right, so it's x, and we'll write cross over z, y. This is fairly standard notation for pullbacks. Uh, it's mildly annoying because the important so like the important detail here is these maps, is, is these maps. And all this talks about is the objects involved. <coughs> um, but this is set of pairs in the product of x and y such that uh, f of x <coughs> equals g of y. <coughs> All right, uh, so I've given you one of these three pieces of information, and now I have to say what these other pieces of information are. Um, and it's just uh, Px goes from the pullback to x, and it sends x comma y to x. And similarly for Py, it's just projection onto y. Because you'll notice that the way I've written this, this is just a subset of the product. Um, let's see. So in fact, you could see it. You could see this map as being the composition of inclusion from here into the product, and then the projection map from the product. Uh, x comma y to y. Okay. So that's an example of a pullback. Um, <coughs> And note that if, like, say, uh, x is the, um, sorry, say if, if z is the terminal object here, um, then this is just going to be the product. So if this, um, and that's, so in this case, it's easy to see that if, if z is a one element set, then everything gets sent to the same spot. So this is always true for all elements of x cross y. So this is just x cross y. And it is, in fact, true in general that if this is the terminal object, then this is just going to be the product. Uh, and similarly, if this is the initial object, then this is going to be a coproduct. And that's a good exercise to think about. Um, I don't think it takes too much thinking about to see that it's, that it's true. <coughs> All right, so now we'll consider um, a push out, and we'll consider it in the category of topological spaces. All right, so we consider a specific push out. Right, so this was, this was, a, this was a pullback of like any two morphisms. Now we're going to think about specific morphisms. So the push out 
um, push out of um, of uh, in the inclusion. <coughs> so we'll call it I of um, the boundary of the two disk, which is the one sphere or the circle, and including that into the two disk. And we'll the push out of this inclusion along itself. Um, so when we're talking about push outs or pullbacks, I might say that this map, I, so I'm lying a little here, but this map is the push out of uh, F along G. And similarly, this map is the push out of G along F. Uh, and same with pullbacks. Like, this map is I'm pulling F back along G. And similarly, this map is I'm pulling G back along F. Um, so maybe I should say the inclusion and the inclusion. All right. <coughs> So I'm just going to do this with a diagram, with a picture. Maybe I will actually use green for this, even though I told you to stop me if I was going to. Um, so we have <coughs> the circle. <coughs> and we include that into the disk. Um, and I'm going to draw the disk like this. Right? So so I've taken a flat disk and I've just poked up in the middle. Up to homeomorphism, it's the same thing. Great. So that's, that's an inclusion. And now I'm going to do the same thing down here. I have the inclusion. Uh, but instead, I'm just going to poke in the other direction. So now I have this, right? So I've poked it down here. So what is the push out in this instance? Well, so what I'm asking for is if I have some other topological space x down here, and a map, a continuous map from here to here, and a continuous map from this disk to here, such that they agree along this circle. So they have to agree along this circle. What's a topological space that also comes with maps that agree on that part, and there's a unique map into here. And it's, this, it's the sphere. Right. So we have this, and then I've got the top half of this, and the bottom half. So it's the two-sphere. And this is included into the north, or the top, and this is included into the south. <coughs> so the point is that if you have two disks and you map them into any topological space in such a way that their boundaries agree, that information is the same thing as the information of a map from a sphere, a two-sphere, into that topological space. Um, and you know, continuity, but we're in top, so all of our maps are continuous. <laughs> <coughs> all right. OK, now we're going to switch gears a little bit <coughs> um, and talk about some universal properties that 
feel to me a bit different from the ones we've been talking about. So we're going to talk about free things. All right. So let x be a set. The free monoid on x, which we're going to denote f x, um, <coughs> uh, let's say the free monoid on x is a pair f x together with a map from x to fx, where this is a monoid, so it's an object in the category of monoids, and this is a map of sets. All right. Is one of these such that, given any map of sets, say x to m, where m is a monoid, <coughs> There exists a unique map from f of x to m in the category of monoids. So it's a monoid homomorphism, <coughs> um, such that, all right, and now we have a commuting diagram. So we have x. We have this f of x, and then we have this monoid. OK, so I want to call this, say, f. And I want to call this, say, f tilde. So we have f. We have this iota map. There is a unique map here. Which we'll call f tilde. <coughs> such that this diagram commutes. All right, so what is? f of x in this case. <coughs> um, f of x is the monoid of words in x. All right. Um, so that is. That is, strings, uh, x1, xn, with um, xi. So it's, it's just strings of elements of the set, um, which you can think of as an alphabet in this case. All right. So it's a monoid. It needs a multiplication. Multiplication is concatenation. So that is, if I have x1, x2, x3 is one word, and then another word is y1, y2, and I multiply them together, I get x1, x2, x3, y1, y2. And that's another string. Um, OK, uh, identity is the empty word. <coughs> uh, and the map, OK, so this is, this is, I've described a monoid. I need to describe this map that comes with it. 
Um, no, I need to describe that from x to fx. And it just sends an element to the string that is just that element. <coughs> All right. For the triangle to commute, uh, we need that um, tilled, uh, phi tilled. Oh, I used different letters here. All right. We need that f tilled of iota of some x equals, OK, well, is equals to f of iota, uh, f tilde of x, because iota just returns this same string, well, that, that element as a string. Um, and for commutativity, I need this to be equal to f of x. OK, so I've given, given an f, I've said what f tilde what well, this has to be on a given one, one length one string. Um, and now I need, I should say what it has to be for any length string. Um, but if f tilde <coughs> is a monoid homomorphism, um, then, OK, well, we have to send the empty word, which I guess I will denote as E, to whatever the um, identity is here. And so that's determined. And now for longer strings, um, we have to have that x1 to xn is equal to, um, oh, because it's what I've written in here. Uh, F tilde of x1, xn has to be equal to F tilde of x1, F tilde of x2, xn. And so by induction, you get length strings of any length. Um, and you should satisfy yourself via a similar argument to the one I made before, that you can't put another homomorphism. You can't, you can't put something else here and have this diagram commuted. All right. So this seems fairly specific um, compared to the things that we've been, that I've been talking about already. Uh, and the point is that this construction generalizes. This construction generalizes. This, this construction of free things. So <coughs> let's see. Uh, in general, the diagram is like this, fx. So OK, so um, let's see. We have three groups. Uh, so we, we, I'm just going to say what fx has to be here in this column, and then what phi tilde has to be here. So the point is that <coughs> these two maps are both, like iota and um, phi, are both maps of sets. But what goes here can be things with more structure. So we have free groups, and so we have group homomorphism here. We can have free abelian groups. Uh, and then this is the same. We can have free uh, 
vector spaces over some field. And then you put linear transformations here. Um, and you can have free R modules. And then you put R linear transformations here. All right. Um, so gave you this construction for a free monoid. We generalized it to the case where we, um, where we have other things. Uh, <coughs> this generalizes further without requiring that these just be set maps and this is a set. Um, <coughs> and so now we're going to see tensor products, which I think people have seen. Hopefully, have people seen tensor products? OK, well, we're going to see tensor products and, um, and some other similar things. All right. <coughs> so um, and we're going to do them with just vector spaces. So tensor products. All right, so we have V and W are vector spaces. Um, I guess we say fix a field. Uh, I like boldface F. Most people like to fix K as a field, little K as a field. Um, I don't know why. All right, so there. Tensor product, right, which will denote V, and then this symbol is tensor W, is a vector space. <coughs> with, so again, I'm specifying an object and a map with a bilinear map <coughs> from, which I'll call iota again, from v cross w to v tensor w. OK. So the product of vector spaces has product. Uh, the category of vector space has products. Um, and by linear map here means that, say, iota of Alpha V plus beta double oh, beta beta V prime W equals alpha iota V W plus beta of iota V prime W. Um, and the same thing in, in W. So for completeness, V alpha W plus beta W prime equals alpha iota V W plus beta iota V W prime. <coughs> OK. So what am I doing? I'm drawing the same diagram I had before. Uh, so I had v, except I'm replacing, replacing x with v cross w. And so if I have some other, what did I use here? I used x. All right. If I have some other vector space, so I have a bilinear map here, iota. If I have some other vector space with a bilinear map, um, which I called. No, phi again. Um, then there is a unique linear transformation here. So <coughs> these are 
bilinear. And this is a linear transformation. <coughs> so I've just replaced on top instead of having set. Now I've got vector spaces and bilinear transformations. Um, so I guess products of two vector spaces and bilinear transformations. Um, <coughs> so I think this is clearer from this than it is from some of the other universal properties we've looked at. Um, <coughs> but you should see that these free things are initial in some sense, right? And similarly, the tensor product of two vector spaces is like initial here. Um, all right. <coughs> um, so we also might form v uh, u tensor v tensor w by asking for trilinear maps from u cross v cross w and doing the same construction. And then we could ask for n, um, n tensor. So, and it's, it's, worth, it's worth noting that like a priori, this is a vector space. So we could put parentheses around this and then tensor it with u. Or we could do what I just said and do trilinear maps out of u cross v cross w. And without checking, those two things aren't immediately the same. And they are the same, um, but there's work, there's like meaningful work to be done there. Um, all right. So we can, oh, do I want to do that? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll just keep going here. <coughs> All right, so we can, we can, can hence form the, picking whichever of those two methods you prefer, the nth tensor power of some vector space v. Um, so we'll call it t n v, and that's going to be v tensored with itself n times. Um, uh, and so that's what are we asking for? We're asking for, so we have um, products from the nth product of v. So this is the symbol for product. This is really the symbol for product, which makes sense because the symbol for coproduct is the this, the other, like upside down. Um, and so then, let's see, T, N, V, uh, and then you have just, I don't know, some other vector space. And then this is um, N linear. This is N linear. And this is a unique linear transformation. <coughs> OK, and now we'll talk about two similar constructions to the tensor product one, um, symmetric and exterior products. So these are, I'm talking about these because they're important, useful pieces of algebra. Uh, I don't know that they'll show up in this course again, but you will probably see them again at some point, uh, particularly if you do differential geometry at the level of um, like differential forms. Uh, you'll see exterior things. All right. So, <coughs> so we can form um, the nth symmetric power. of v, which we'll denote by uh, snv. So v is some vector space. Um, and we do it by the same diagram we have here. So we have uh, a 
product, the product of n copies of v, um, and then we have S n v, and then we have some other vector space. Um, it's going to come. This is going to equip, come equipped with some map here. Uh, there's going to be a unique phi tilde here, and there's going to be some map. Yeah. All right. Now we want to put some conditions on these things. So, iota and phi are symmetric multilinear. All right, so multilinear is like what I'm talking about here. So here it's n linear because I've fixed an n. Um, and symmetric, symmetric means that uh, symmetric means that phi of v1, vi, vi plus one up to vn is equal to vi plus 1, vi, vn for all i. <coughs> Which basically means that um, whatever input you put in, if you swap any of the vectors, you should still get the same thing. <coughs> um, all right. And then this is still a linear transformation. So it's important to note that here we can form tensor products of any of any pair of things, of any pair of vector spaces. But here we really needed that it was symmetric, because otherwise, um, if one of these was a copy of W, you wouldn't be able to swap it with um, anything else. OK. So that's the symmetric power. Um, and we can form. Uh, the nth exterior power um, which I'm going to denote as this uh, wedge nv <coughs> um, and we need uh, iota and phi to be um, anti-symmetric multilinear maps. All right, and so what does anti-symmetric here mean? All right, this means that uh, f vi to vn equals 0 if um, vi equals vi plus 1 for some i. All right. This is equivalent to what you probably think it should be, which is that if you swap two of the vectors next to each other, you get the negative of the thing. Um, and that is the case as long as your field is not characteristic to. All right. And then the last. Um, Construction I wanted to talk about. Well, the last. I mean, you can decide if it's if you think it's one construction or three. <coughs> is that we have the tensor algebra on 
on V is, we're just going to denote it TV, which is the direct sum um, for n greater than or equal to 0 of the nth tensor power of V. So here we define the nth tensor power. And now we're just summing them for all n. Um, <coughs> for 0, this is just the ground field. Um, Tn is the ground field for 0. Um, now what do I mean by algebra? And algebra, well, in general, you should think algebra means um, vector space with a multiplication. There are more general things. But for, for now, what it means is that this is a vector space, which it is, because it's a direct sum of a bunch of vector spaces. Um, and there's some way of multiplying elements, basically. All right, so what's the multiplication? The multiplication sends v dot w to v tensor w. So what's happening here, v is in some tmv, and w is in some tnv. So this is really like a tensor of things, and this is a tensor of things. And so now you end up with something in tm plus nv. So this is, in fact, a graded algebra, but that's not really super important right now. <coughs> All right. So in a similar way, we have the symmetric algebra on V, which is the direct sum, well, n greater than or equal to 0 of SNV. Um, and we have the, so this is the, this is the symmetric algebra. <coughs> and then we have the exterior algebra, um, which is wedge v and is the direct sum for n greater than or equal to 0 of wedge n v. So actually, if v is, v, if v is um, finite dimensional, uh, this thing can only get so big um, uh, because once you get above that, dimension, you're sort of guaranteed to have something that forces everything to be 0. <coughs> All right, this has the same multiplication um, as, like, these all multiply the same way. Uh, in exterior powers, you're more likely to see, like, v little wedge w instead of v tensor w. Um, here, uh, but that, that's for a specific construction. So you've probably seen, if you've seen tensor products before, you'll have seen like a, um, an actual construction of this. Um, and similar constructions are possible for the symmetric powers and the exterior powers. You, um, uh, what is it? You take, you take some big thing and you quotient out by a bunch of stuff. By, by exactly the relations that you want, really. All right. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that there are universal properties for these. Um, and I actually didn't need to erase that diagram because it's going to be the same diagram. So we have our vector space. We have, say, TV. So this is the tensor algebra on V. And this is just some other algebra. So it's a vector space over our ground field 
that has a multiplication. All right. This comes with um, an iota. In this case, it's actually just inclusion into T1V because the first tensor power is just a copy of the vector space. <coughs> and given any other linear map, um, from given any linear map from V <coughs> from V into A, because A is an algebra, so it's a vector space, and V is just a vector space, there is a unique algebra homomorphism such that this diagram commutes. All right, so this is just linear. This is linear. This is an algebra homomorphism, which is linear but accounts for the like multiplication on these two different algebras. All right, and now um, SV has the same uh, universal property. Um, but replace A with commutative algebras. Okay, so um, there is a similar universal property for exterior algebras, but it requires super algebras, which is not a thing I know anything about. Um, so uh, if you wanted to do some sort of exercise, um, a good exercise for like all of the universal properties we've seen today is to satisfy yourself that you can define a category in which anything satisfying one of those universal properties is the initial object or, or terminal object. Um, right, so <coughs> this might be giving it away a bit, but in this, ca in this case, you can have the, cat the category where the object are bilinear maps from V cross W into a vector space. And then the morphisms are linear transformations between um, the vector spaces at the end of those maps, such that the diagram commutes. And then the tensor product, together with this map, is the initial object in that category. And you should go through and look at the universal properties we've looked at and at least convince yourself that they're initial or terminal in some category. I mean the point is to is to is to, is to think about it in general, right? Like I don't want to think about these universal properties as being in some specific category. I want to think about, I have a universal property. If it exists in some category, then. So is this only for those tribal ones? <coughs> no, you should be able to th like. think about it for like push outs and products and et cetera. What time is it? It's 11.30. Um, People happy to go for a little bit longer? Yeah. Oh. All right. All right. I'm just going to, because I wrote six pages for the first lecture and then six pages for this lecture, and I have 10 pages for next lecture. Um, so I'd like to do some of this now. Um, so that everything we've covered now sort of was one contained. I'm just talking about universal properties today. Um, I want to talk about a bunch of different universal properties that are important in lots of areas that involve algebra so that you've seen them because 
sort of the earlier you see them, the less annoying it is when they turn up later. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just define what a functor is. So a functor is the notion of um, a morphism between categories. <coughs> and it preserves the important structures of a, of a category, which is really the morphisms. And what you want to preserve is composition and identities. So, <coughs> Sorry, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it doesn't have to be a category at all. No. no. Okay, but I mean, it, it. When I say structure preserving, I mean it keeps. It brings us. Yeah. Okay, so a, and I will we'll very rarely say this. A covariant functor. which we'll write as f from a category C to a category D, assigns um, to objects of C an object of D. So, sends, say, x in C to fx in D. <coughs> sometimes I'll use parentheses, sometimes I won't. It's, um, and to morphisms f from, say, x to y in C, uh, a morphism f of f from f of x to f of y. Uh, satisfying that um, for a composable pair in C, so maps F and G, we have that F of G composed with F of F is the same map as f of g composed with f. So it preserves composition. And secondly, that for all objects in C, um, applying the functor to the identity on x gives you the identity on the, of the functor applied to that object. Okay. That's what a functor is. A contravariant functor um, so we'll also go from a category C to a category D. <coughs> assigns objects the same way. So we have some x and c goes to some fx in d. But now it assigns a morphism um, f from x to y to a morphism um, f of f from f of y to f of x. <coughs> uh, so a contravariant functor is one that 
It sends objects to objects, and it sends morphisms to morphisms, but it turns them around. So the morphisms are facing the other direction now. Um, and it has to be the case that, all right, so we still want composition to be preserved. Um, but now we've reversed sort of the way the arrows go. So that has to come with a reverse in the composition. So now f of f composed with f of g is equal to f of g composed with f. Um, and we still need to preserve the identity. So uh, f of the identity on x is the identity of fx. All right. All right, that's what I'm about to say. So Exercise. Convince yourself that a contravariant functor is a functor or a covariant functor. Uh, Contravariant functor f from c to d is a functor um, from c up to d. And so that's why I put covariant, <coughs> that's why I put covariant in brackets here, because I won't really talk about contravariant functors. I will just write the functor as being from c up into wherever, rather than writing a contravariant functor from c into d. All right. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave examples for next time, and we'll stop there. All right, thanks, guys.